Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Hayward. I am the culture editor at Decrypt, but today we are not going to talk about culture. We're going to talk about carbon markets and how blockchain technology can improve them. And I've got some real experts here that are going to tell me all about it and tell you all about it. So why don't we go down the line? Each of you can introduce yourselves, please. Yeah, my name is Paul Gamble. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nori. We are a carbon removal marketplace, um, working with farmers who sequester carbon in their croplands by changing their farming practices. And uh, our, our, our crypto market is about creating a true reference price for carbon, because no one actually knows what that price is or should be. I'm Nora Rothman. I'm a product lead at Toucan Protocol. We are building the infrastructure to tokenize carbon and make it programmable on Web3. Hi, my name's Charlie Moore. I'm with Chainlink Labs, where I look after our carbon and sustainability solutions. Uh, we're a decentralized Oracle network known for putting a lot of uh, price feed data on, on chain, but in this context, we're putting a lot of carbon data uh, um, on chain, be it the, uh, the registration, the uh, uh, verification, and, uh, and other details around the carbon credits to support a variety of use cases. Awesome, thank you. So, you know, why don't you start off by telling me about the carbon markets as they are today, and you know, what are some of the biggest weaknesses or issues with them? So I'll do a brief history lesson. Uh, carbon crediting has been around since the late 1990s. The UN developed a mechanism called the Clean Development Mechanism to create frameworks for how you could establish carbon credits for projects that avoid or reduce future emissions from happening. And in, in the way of implementing that, there have been a number of different uh, nonprofit carbon offset registries like Vera and Gold Standard that were developed to create protocols for how you would measure and verify uh, that the carbon has been avoided or removed. Um, but as time has progressed over the last couple of decades, uh, more and more the, the market, especially the, the types of companies who want to pay for carbon credits, who are producing emissions and so they want to pay other people to reduce their emissions, they've realized that they've been moving, they want to move more and more into a direction where they're actually removing uh, past emissions that are, have already been up there. So you're, you're a corporate emitter, um, you know, you have uh, uh, logistics in your supply chain that are producing carbon emissions, so you want to pay other people to pull that CO2 out of the atmosphere. And the way the market exists today is there is a severe shortage of supply side uh, project developers who are actually doing that removal and sequestration because it's actually quite difficult physically and it's also difficult to measure and verify that. So the, the state of the market today is there's actually an enormous amount of demand out there to pay for carbon removal and carbon sequestration uh, and not enough supply to meet that demand. It is a massively inefficient market, so I, I generally lump the, the challenges into sort of improving the efficiency and improving the integrity of, of, of the market. So I wholeheartedly agree with what Paul's saying in terms of there's a lot more demand than, than supply, and, and part of the challenge is getting a project to be funded is a really long, painful process. So li literally measured in months or years, requiring the project developer, so if you're a forest owner in Brazil, it can take years to actually get your project verified and listed with a reg registry um, and, and to market to be, uh, to be funded. It's, it's a very manual, slow, inefficient process. So Web3 has got a huge opportunity to, to improve that efficiency. And similarly, in terms of the, the, in, the integrity of the, the information supporting that, uh, that carbon credit, um, that is absolutely huge. A carbon credit is a series of, of information um, a, about the particular project. Um, and it is prone to errors or, or, or abuse. Um, and related, when one of the challenges is that if you are a nefarious actor uh, um, wanting to sell your offset project twice, you can just list it with two separate registries and uh, um, sell it multiple times. So uh, the power of Web3 is in helping resolve many of those sort of integrity issues as well as generally improve the efficiency of the market. Uh, why don't we dig into that then? How can Web3 help solve these issues? You want to lead off, Nora? Yeah. Um, transparency, as Charlie was saying, is, is a really big piece of it. Uh, so both 
basically preventing anyone from double counting, right? Because all of the information is public, anyone can access it, anyone can verify where these carbon credits have gone. Um, and then also just the transparency of who the consumers are and who the suppliers are as well. Um, additionally, as far as efficiency goes, if you basically bring carbon credits on chain, you open them up to be building blocks for this entire industry and allow these projects to be both regenerative as well as you know just seeking economic gain. I, I think there's a, another area that um, blockchain sort of transparency and provenance can really add, which is uh, at Nori, our perspective is that we believe carbon itself should not be traded. Um, so historically, going back to the origination of those carbon credits back in the late 90s, the original market designers wanted a tradable commodity asset so that you could facilitate price discovery and actually figure that out. So you want to have like markets that are trading this, just like you would have any market that's trading like uh, uh, futures contracts for corn or wheat or oil. That, that's how you know what the price is. But in the process of doing so, we end up with a situation today where sometimes carbon credits can be traded, sold, resold many times, even like a dozen times or more. And when you think about it, if we have a supply shortage, we, what we need to be doing is redesigning the system so that every new dollar spent on carbon results in net new carbon that's coming out of the atmosphere. And so when a broker is just reselling a carbon credit and adding uh, their own you know, transaction fee on top of that, that's not creating more incentives for more supply side, it's just middlemen taking their cut. And so uh, blockchain gives us the ability to create other assets that can represent this. And this is something we do at Nori, where we've got really two assets. There's the carbon credit itself, and then there's the token, the fungible token that is meant to be like a gift card or a coupon that can be redeemed for carbon. And that, that's really only possible to do uh, using uh, crypto protocols underneath it. Um, Nora, Charlie, why don't you tell me a bit about what you're working on as well, since he just spoke about Nori. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, Toucan is really focused on the infrastructure piece of this puzzle. You've heard a lot about carbon markets. They've been around for 30 years. It's really kind of a monster to wrap one's head around. But on that cycle, um, we are focused on bringing carbon on chain. And specifically, our main products are like DeFi primitives. So we're bridging carbon tokens from one of those legacy registries on chain. So that bridge is one of our main products and maintaining the security of that, improving that. Um, and then additionally, we're looking at providing off-chain data layers so that the Web2 world can benefit from the transparency of data there. But really the idea for us, like the key vision is carbon Legos and how can we make carbon something that all of you guys can build with and can embed in all of the projects that you are working on. And we're happy to say right now we have over 100 different projects that are building with our TCO2s, which is one of our tokens, or NCT or BCT. So Chainlink is open source middleware. We're used in, in hundreds of, of different different use cases, but I think probably one of the, the biggest one over the last year or two has been helping get a lot of the measurement data on chain, so the measurement reporting verification, MRV, um, which is has been innovating with a lot of satellite imagery and, and, and sensor type data, which historically was generally a manual process. So. Getting that on chain has been really uh, um, helpful for then uh, enabling a number of new use cases. So um, just this week, some partners launched a, uh, um, a company, Chorist, launched NF Trees, um, which is tokenizing individual trees, but bringing in real time or close to real time uh, satellite monitoring of, of that tree. So it's effectively an, a, a dynamic uh, a, a NF tree, uh, cute, cute name. Um, but conceptually, the, you know, the, the idea of a carbon credit being this sort of living smart asset as opposed to a very dumb static asset is, is something of a game changer for, for, for this market. And that in itself can sort of trigger all sorts of cool use cases uh, around 
um, the performance of that, that carbon offset, not least the price of that carbon offset. So, you know, if, if the project isn't actually working, uh, it's, it shouldn't be really worth, worth as much. So being able to reflect that in the actual price of the, uh, of, of, of the carbon credit. Um, and then using smart contracts to trigger things like parametric insurance. So if the, if the trees in the forest burn down, then uh, um, that parametric insurance kicks in um, and ensures that those trees can be, uh, that, 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 that can be replaced or with an alternative uh, project can be replaced. Similarly, rewarding the, the multiple stakeholders, not least the, the, the project owner, the farmer, who, whoever's actually it is that's uh, taken it to market, being able to, every time that offset's uh, traded um, or based on the performance of that project, being able to re reward the, uh, um, the original project developer. You know, all these things, by bringing that carbon credit with the relevant information on chain, um, enabling smart contracts can really trigger some, some exciting new use cases that I think can really scale this market because we've got to, in order for us to hit these big goals and targets that they've been talking about at, at the UN this week, um, we need to scale the voluntary carbon market, carbon market something like 50-fold over the next seven, eight years. Um, that's not going to be done on spreadsheets and manual verification, wandering around counting trees. We've got to really bring exciting new technology, not just Web3, web but you know, as I say, some of the satellite and uh, um, sensor uh, technologies and other technologies uh, um, to, to this uh, um, particular issue and uh, um, use that to help scale this. And so how important is it that all of this takes place you know, with open source software and an open blockchain? Well, the problem is you can't see or smell carbon dioxide. So you have to have a lot of transparency in order to ensure that what is being transacted upon actually took place. And when we talk with our customers, like the thing that they care about is they want to see the, the, the you know, for us, in our case, the farms. They want to see the farmer. They want to learn about what practices they're doing. What They want to see what crops they're growing. They want to read the verification report. They, and they want to have this collateral that they can then share with their own stakeholders. Because the, the types of companies that are buying carbon removal credits are doing so for brand marketing purposes. They want to show that their own customers, their own uh, stakeholders or owners, that they're, they're doing uh, what they need to do in order to um, achieve something like a net zero footprint. So by being able to put all of this on chain, you've got this you know, metadata record of all of that stuff. It's, it's just the obvious application of, of using a blockchain for storing this data forever. Yeah, it's also a huge user base, which I keep emphasizing, but we were talking about this before, um, and Paul was emphasizing this, like, you just, if you, can, if you can bring this to the playground, as we see at a place like this, where it fosters so much creativity, people are gonna play with it. And again, the more we can embed regeneration into the DeFi world, the better the rules are gonna be for all of us in the future. Yeah, I, and I would echo all of that. I think there's going to be a lot of innovation coming out of this uh, this this community. Um, I think but we've also got to recognize that most project developers and most institutional buyers don't care about the technology piece in the middle, and they, if anything, they're actually scared by the technology piece in, in, in the middle. So, you know, in terms of marketing and positioning to that world, we've just got to focus on, you know, this is a lot more efficient. You get to market much, much faster, much, much cheaper. Um, and, uh, you know, from the institutional perspective, you know, with much, much greater integrity and certainty of what you're actually buying is what you're actually getting. You know, what would you say are the biggest challenges to you know, bringing this to scale to reach many more um, you know, participants? Measurement and verification. Uh, so the way that we do this with farmers is there is a third party company that we partner with who is using this underlying USDA protocol for measuring carbon in their soil. And that works great inside the US, but no such tool exists outside of the US right now. And you can think of, like, there are lots of different ways you can pull carbon out of the air. There are more nature-based solutions like soil carbon, trees, kelp, uh, and so on. And then there are more engineered or industrialized solutions like direct air capture, carbon-negative cement, construction materials, biochar. And the trade-off is that the nature-based stuff is far more scalable. There's a lot more storage potential that you could do right now today. But it's much more difficult to measure. And then the more engineered things are 
way easier to measure because you're talking about sensors on pipes and that sort of thing. But the total volume that is happening there is so infinitesimally small, it's, it hardly, hardly shows up on any charts. So the, the biggest, most important thing that people need to be working on right now is how do you measure this stuff better? Yeah, I mean, there are so many challenges to getting this to really take off. Um, I think one thing that Toucan has been working really hard on is being a bridge, not just a technical bridge, but also a bit of a political bridge between the sort of incumbents and the Web3 worlds. Like, you know, we have to recognize that this industry has been around for over 30 years and there is a lot of very solid foundation, very good work that has gone into getting the industry to where it is now. And it's kind of like, how do we maintain that goodwill and maintain that integrity, but also, as Charlie was saying, like, speed this shit up, because we do not have time. So agree with, with all of that. So, you know, I certainly see there's a need for that connective tissue across across the ecosystem. It is a pretty distributed um, universe in terms of the, the, the verifiers, the project uh, developers, the, the, the registries, the uh, exchanges, the institutional buyers, etc. And, uh, you know, there is a, a danger that they're all sort of, as they start to embrace Web3, that they, they go off in different directions and use different platforms. So that sort of interoperability and connectivity is absolutely key. But I, I, I think most of the technology is it's largely there now. It's, it's as much around um, connecting people and, and uh, education. So I've, I've spent most of this week at, at the UN and uh, related carbon uh, um, banking conferences. And, um, you know, there's still a, a huge job to be done in terms of educating those guys about Web3 and the value and sort of some of the use cases that we've touched on here. And, um, you know, equally in terms of the Web3 world, you know, there's probably a lot of education that, that needs to be done in terms of this evolving carbon market. So I think sort of bridging the talent in the Web3 world, um, you know, into, in, into, into the institutional carbon market and vice versa, um, and being able to sort of talk the same language and, uh, um, you know, educate on both sides, I think is going to be critical. All right, we just have a couple minutes left, so let's wrap with this. Um, let's talk about impact. You know, how much of an impact can this technology have in combating climate change? Well, the interesting thing is that when it comes to crypto and crypto product protocols, we make our own money. And so there's so much more potential value creation that's happening that can be applied and directed towards carbon removal than I think could come from, even if you totaled all of the Fortune 500 companies and all of their net zero commitments, all of the carbon that they want to remove and offset, I think it pales in comparison in size and scope to what can actually be applied when you start figuring out how to gamify and uh, integrate carbon removal into the background of basically every application that we use in our normal lives. Like, if you think about it, like when you go to a restaurant or something like that, you're producing some sort of waste and garbage, and it's not like when you get your bill from the server that the there's like a garbage removal line item on the receipt. It's just built into the cost of doing business. And carbon is moving in the direction where that will be handled in the same way. We've just never had the tools or infrastructure to do so before. So with, with crypto, there's so much more opportunity to expand and, and think of it like, it's not how much carbon do you have to remove, it's how much carbon can you remove. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I mean, if you think about if crypto is the future of finance, then we obviously want carbon offsetting to be a part of crypto. And if carbon offsetting can just be built into every transaction that we ever make, it's going to be deploying a tool. Like, there are a lot of detractors for carbon offsetting, and those arguments are very valid. However, we're at the stage in the climate crisis where it's like, we have to do everything that we can. We have to, we have to tackle this from all angles. So the carbon market is like, it's ready to be deployed on a massive scale. It's just that the tools aren't there to really deploy it. Um, so that's what this innovation can do. Right, and so, so you know, one of the the opportunities is there isn't a lot of existing infrastructure there, um, which makes it slightly easier to sort of Im embed Web three, unlike sort of other other asset classes. Um, 
clearly to get from like a billion dollar market to a $50 billion market in six, seven years, I can't think of any other way to do it um, than, than to leverage Web3. But we've got to lead with solutions rather than the technology. Uh, um, and we've got to educate and bring a lot of different stakeholders on that journey. All right, that's all the time we have. Charlie, Nora, Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you.